Okay, we're recording. Whenever you want to start, you can start. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. I'm going to be reading from a story I wrote called Corpse Mouth, which appears in an anthology edited by Ellen Datlow called The Monstrous. I'm not going to read the whole story because it's kind of long. I'm going to read a little excerpt from it, sort of self-contained. This was, um, this is a story about a narrator who goes back to Scotland where his parents are from after his father has died. And he's trying to understand, I, I suppose, his father's life, his father's experience. And his mother has gone too, as has his younger sister. And his uncle, Stuart, has offered to give him and his sister a tour of the area, a, a, a motor tour. Um, so he goes with his uncle one day, and, and this is what happens. Once he was home from work the next day, Uncle Stuart made good on his promised tour of the area. Mackenzie came too. The three of us squeezed into his car, a white Nissan Micra whose cramped interior lived up to its name, and off we went. A soft-spoken man, Stuart kept a cigarette lit and burning between his lips for most of the drive. He worked for a high-tech manufacturer who had moved into one of the old shipping buildings. He was what my parents called crafty, which meant he had a knack for artistic projects. Fifteen years before, when he'd been laid off his job at the shipyards and unable to find another, he had turned his efforts to building doll-sized replicas of old, horse-drawn travelers' trailers. He'd gifted one to my parents, who placed it in their bedroom, where my siblings and I went to admire it. The detail on the trailer was amazing, from the flowered curtains hung inside the small windows to the ornaments on the porcelain horse's bridle. He bought the horses in bulk from a department store. Stewart had sold his trailers, first to family, then to friends, then to friends of friends, then to their friends, the money he earned helping to keep his family afloat until he found a new job. He was also a repository of local knowledge, some of which he shared with Mackenzie and me as he steered the Micra up and down Greenock's steep streets. He showed us the house our father had grown up in, the apartment where our mother had been raised by her mother, the church where our parents had married. He drove us down to the river, to the esplanade, and along to where a few cranes stood at the water's edge like enormous steel insects. He drove us east, out of town, towards Glasgow, so that he could show us Dumbarton Rock across the Clyde, a great rocky molar whose ragged crown stood 200 feet above the river. A scattering of stone blocks was visible at the summit. Nodding at the rock, Stuart said, there's been a castle of some sort there forever, the words emerging from his mouth in puffs of cigarette smoke that his open window caught and sucked out of the car. Back when the Vikings held the mouth of the Clyde and the islands, that was the westernmost stronghold of the British. Before that, the local kings ruled from atop it, like the castle in Edinburgh, Stirling too. There's a story that Merlin played, paid the place a visit in the 6th century. King Arthur's Merlin, I said. Aye, the king at the time was called Ritter. They called him the Generous. King Arthur's nephew, Hole, was passing through, and he was injured, fell off his horse or the like. King Ritter put him up when he, while he was healing. When Ritter's foes learned he had King Arthur's nephew under his roof, they laid siege to the place. Ritter had a magic sword, Dernwin, that burst into flame whenever he drew it, but he and his men were pretty badly outnumbered. There was no way he could get word to King Arthur down in Camelot in time for it to do him any good. It looked as if Arthur's nephew was going to be killed while under Ritter's care. So was Ritter himself, but you see what I'm saying. It would be a big dishonor for Ritter, alive or dead. Stuart steered toward an exit on the left that took us to a roundabout. He followed it halfway around until we were heading back toward Greenock. As he did, he said, this was when Marilyn showed up. He'd been keeping an eye on Hole, and he'd seen the trouble Ritter was in for his hospitality to Arthur's kin. He presented himself to the king and offered his assistance. No offense, says Ritter. But you're one man. There's a thousand men at my front door. What can you do about a force of that size? Well, says Marilyn, the king has a point. He is only one man, and although his father was a devil, there is a limit to his power. However, says he, I have allies I can call upon for help, and against them no force of men can stand. Then I wish you'd ask those friends for their aid, says Ritter. Marilyn says okay. He tells the king he needs a corpse. The fresher the better. 
It just so happens that earlier that very day, Riddick's men caught a couple of their enemies attempting to sneak over the castle wall. He has his men bring them before him and right on the spot executes the pair. There you go, he says to Marilyn, there's two corpses for you. Good, says Marilyn. He has the king's soldiers carry the bodies right outside the front gate. It's going on night time and Riddick's foes have withdrawn to their tents. Marilyn instructs the soldiers to dig a shallow grave, one big enough for the two dead men. Once it's been dug, he has them lay the corpses in it and cover them over. Then he sets to, using his staff to draw all manner of strange characters in the soil. He was a great one for writing, was Marilyn. If you read some of the older stories about him, he's always writing on things, prophecies of coming events, usually. King Ritter watches him, but he doesn't recognize the characters Marilyn scratching into the dirt. When he's done, Marilyn steps back from the grave. Pretty soon, the earth begins to tremble. It moves from somewhere deep below them, as if something's digging its way up to them. Over in the siege camp, a few of Riddick's enemies have been watching Marilyn's show. As the ground shakes, more of them run to see what's causing the disturbance. The soil over the grave jumps, and a great head pushes its way through the dirt. It's a man's head, but it's the size of a hut. The hair is clotted with earth, the skin is all leathery, shrunk to the skull, the eyes are empty pits, the lips are blackened, pulled back from teeth the size of a man's arm. The arms and legs of the bodies the king's men buried hang out over the teeth, the remainder of the corpses inside the huge mouth. It's a giant, Marilyn summoned, but no such giant as anyone there has ever heard tell of. It's as much an enormous corpse as those it crunches between its teeth. It keeps coming, head and neck, shoulders and arms, chest and hips, until it towers above them. You can imagine the reaction of Riddick's foes, sheer panic. The king and his men aren't too far away from it themselves. Marilyn touches his arm and says, steady. He points to the siege camp and says to the monster, right, those are for you. The giant doesn't need to be told twice. It takes a couple of steps, and it's in the midst of the enemy fighters, most of whom are trampling each other in their haste to get away from it. It leans down, sweeps up a handful of men, and stuffs them into its mouth. It stomps others like they're ants. It kicks campfires apart, catches men, and tears them to pieces. A few try to fight it. They grab their spears and swords and stab it. But that leathery skin is too tough, their blades can't pierce it. Soon the giant's feet are covered in gore. Its lips and chin are smeared with the blood of the men it's eaten. There's no satisfying the thing. It continues to jam screaming men into its mouth. In a matter of a few minutes, Marilyn's monster has broken the siege. In a few more, it's routed Riddick's foes. Some of them flee to the ships they sailed here. The giant pursues them, smashes the prows of the ships, breaks off a mast, and uses it as a club on ships and men alike. King Riddick turns to Mar Marilyn and says, What is this thing you've brought forth? That, says Marilyn, is Corpse Mouth. Corpse Mouth, says Riddick. Him I have not heard of. Marilyn says he and his brethren were worshipped here many a long year ago. He was not known as Corpse Mouth then, but what his original name was has been lost. He and his kindred were replaced by other gods, who were replaced by newer gods than those, and so on until the Romans brought their gods and now the Christians theirs. All of Corpse Mouth's fellows went to the place old gods go when men are done with them, the graveyard of the gods. Corpse Mouth, though, refused to suffer the same fate as his kin. Instead, he lived on their remains. If any men stumbled across him, they were his. As later generations of gods came to the graveyard, so Corpse Mouth had them too. Down through the ages he has continued, losing hold of everything he used to be, until all that remains is his hunger. Ritter watches the giant crushing the last remnants of his enemies. He says, this is blasphemy. Maybe, Marilyn says, but it saved King Arthur's nephew, and it saved you too, which Ritter can't argue with. Once the last of the enemy fighters is dead, the giant, Corpse Mouth, turns in the direction of Marilyn and the king. Ritter puts his hand on his sword, but Marilyn tells him to keep it in its sheath. He points his staff at the hills behind Dumbarton Rock. Corpse Mouth nods that great, gruesome head and walks off in that direction. That's the last Ritter sees of him and of Marilyn, for the matter. I don't suppose he was too upset about either. Stuart's story had taken us all the way back to his front door. He pulled the parking brake and turned off the engine. 
And that, he said with a grin, is a wee bit of your local history. Mackenzie and I thanked him for the story and for the tour. While we were walking up to the house, my sister said, where did Marilyn send the monster? Corpse mouth. Our uncle paused at the front door. The story doesn't say. Maybe north to the mountains. That's where many terrible and awful beasts were said to dwell. I'll tell you what I think. A few miles east of Dumbarton Rock, there was an old burial place unearthed in the 1930s. It was the talk of this part of the country. I remember my father speaking about it. The fellows who dug it up said they found evidence of an ancient temple there. Scotland Stonehenge, the papers called it. What happened to it, I said. Can you visit it? They put a pair of apartment buildings over the spot, Stuart said. The war interrupted the excavation. Then, when the war was over, another group of scientists said the chaps who discovered the place had overstated its significance. There were a few rock carvings that were of interest, they said, but as long as they were removed and sent to the museum in Glasgow, they saw no reason not to build the high-rises there. So the men from the museum came and cut out the pieces of rock to be preserved, and the rest became part of the foundation for the new construction. My father was upset about it, about all of it, but especially about the carvings being taken away. There's folk put they things there for a reason, he says, and yon men from the museum would do well enough to leave them be. There's no telling what trouble they'll stir. I suppose he had a point. Although, Stuart added, I've yet to see any giants prowling the hills. But if you ask me, that's where Marilyn told Quartzmouth to go. Thank you very much. Now, it's time for other business. <laughs>